Um, so I wanted to talk about the financing options. So once, once the budget is prepared, where do you get the money? Now, Steve has talked about some of these things, but I just want to go over uh, in a little bit more detail some of these so you understand sort of the, the background and the philosophy on these. Probably in your town in Hampton, I'm sure you've got lots of capital reserve funds, expendable trust funds, you've been bonding, you're doing all of these things. But just to have a little bit more background, what is the philosophy on the different ways to finance the budget that you're putting together. Um, so I'm going to go into a little bit more detail with these. I did want to talk to you about state aid um, and where we are with the state budget up to date. I was at the legislature until 2.30 today finding out exactly what the Senate was doing in terms of uh, revenues coming to cities and towns. So I wanted to cover a little bit of that with you because that obviously is going to affect you for the next two years as the state's um, developing their budget. And then um, the last thing I wanted to cover is a, a little bit about the property tax, the, the rate setting process as Steve said, and more importantly, that piece about how do you estimate how much something is going to cost on your budget, whether that's an increase or a decrease in revenue or an increase in appropriation or a decrease in appropriation. Some of you may know how to figure out that estimate. How much would $500,000 appropriation be on your tax rate? How much would $25,000 be? Some of you may know how to do that. I'm assuming not all of you know how to do it. but. When you leave here tonight, you will know how to estimate that. And um, I've been told by quite a few people that um, that was the most handy tool to have in my presentation, and that's why I keep it until the end. <laughs> so so um, with that said, um, we've already talked a little bit, Steve's already talked a little bit about the re the, um, the reserve funds. And as he said, these are savings accounts. The, the difference between these is that the expendable trust is really in, intended to be for sort of maintenance type of areas, whereas the capital reserve funds are for kind of specific capital improvements. Now, I can tell you that in those years when I was back at the Department of Revenue Administration, this was an area that a lot of municipalities had disallowances because they named it the wrong thing. They wanted to set something up, you know, to, to provide, you know, to raise and appropriate ten thousand dollars for the maintenance of the town hall, but they would call it the town the, the town hall maintenance capital reserve fund. They it was it, it just was going into the wrong category, or it was a capital expenditure that they put in an expendable trust. And they had they were disallowing so many of these appropriations. Finally we said, you know what? Let's just go get the law changed to say that the same rules apply regardless of what you're calling it. So when you look at the rules for capital reserve funds, um, it'll refer back to the expendable trust fund. So how do you set these up? How do you um, get rid of them when there's, they're no longer needed? What if you set one up and you ha it, the purpose is no longer, you don't need that Ford F-150 from 2001, but you've got $15,000 in that account, how do you get rid of it? Um, the rules still apply. It's the same thing. So basically, these are your savings accounts, and obviously, these are for sort of, uh, at least the capital reserve fund, it's kind of for the big ticket items, and probably you're doing these for some of, some of those um, projects on your capital improvements program that you you know you're, you're going to have to fund these things uh, sometime in the near future. So really it is. These are your savings accounts for doing those things. The expendable trusts, um, really good to set up for things like um, those unexpected increases in health insurance, for example. So you could have an expendable trust for um, health insurance increases or, you know, some other um, insurance inc increases or, you know, plowing expenses because we may have another winter like we just had, those kinds of things. Um, lease agreements. So um, municipalities can enter into lease agreements. The big thing here is, uh, and I think Steve did allude to this, is whether You've, whether you can get out of the agreement or not. You can certainly lease something for multiple years, so you could have a five-year lease to lease a piece of equipment, but it's that fine print in that lease agreement that is going to dictate whether it's going to need just a majority vote or a supermajority two-thirds vote. If you can get out of the lease, then it's just going to require a majority vote because you're not binding a future town meeting. If you can't really get out of that lease and you're locked into it for five years, 
then it is viewed as if it is debt. You're really signing an agreement, and you're binding future town meetings to, uh, to appropriate the money for that lease for, the ne for not just this year, but for the going into the future. So it's going to need a supermajority. And I think where I've heard some of the, <laughs> the issues is that some of the vendors, because obviously the vendors are interested in having it as easy as possible to get these approved, so they will attempt to write the lease so that it appears that it's only a majority vote needed. But again, when you read that fine print, not only does it say you have to give back that fire truck if you don't appropriate the money, but it then says, and you can't buy a similar piece of equipment for the next five years. So, you know, they kind of lock you in with that. So you, you got to look at that fine print. But certainly um, looking at some of your big equipment items like that, Leases are, uh, you know, one of the financing tools that you can use. Um, from the bonding standpoint, um, and again, you've you've issued bonds before. Basically, what you're doing it's it's just like a mortgage. You're you're um, borrowing money and you're promising who's ever um, investing in your bonds that you are going to pay those that money back over uh, a period of time. Usually, you're doing these bonding projects. They're usually expensive. There, a lot of times it's for your infrastructure is when you're going to use the, the bond financing, long-term paybacks, you know, t 20 to 30 years. There's um, generally two, two types of bonds. One is called general obligation bonds, and this is where the full faith and credit of the municipality is backing those bonds, okay? The revenue bonds, we see this occasionally. Um, there's a certain revenue stream that is backing the bond. So it's not the full faith and credit of the town, but a specific revenue stream. So a parking garage is an example. City of Manchester built a very expensive parking garage, but it was going to be those parking fees that were going to pay back the bond that they uh, took out to build that parking garage. So um, in most cases, probably most of your bonds, I would imagine, are general obligation bonds. With the bonding, there's a separate chapter. It's RSA Chapter 33. You, the most important thing is you have to dot every I and cross every T and follow that law to a T. And as Steve indicated, DRA can disallow it, but long before DRA would get around to disallowing a bond article because you didn't dot your I's and cross your T's, you, would, you will not be able to get bond council approval to issue those bonds. So more important than DRA is bond council. So you do have to um, follow um, exactly what the law says. Um, the interesting part of the bond issue is if you do it right, you dot your I's, you cross your T's, you bring it to town meeting, and they approve it, um, you're going to have a series of payments, debt service payments, that you're going to have to pay back over a certain number of years, 10, 15, 20 years, whatever. If a future town meeting neglects or refuses to appropriate that money to pay back that debt service, there's a statute that says DRA can insert that payment and cause you to raise it in your tax rate. That is one of the rare occasions where a non-appropriated amount is going to be included in your tax rate whether or not the voters um, approve that. The reason being is we as a state cannot have a municipality default on a bond payment. One municipality defaulting on a bond, pay on a bond payment would have ramifications for the entire state uh, including the state of New Hampshire's bond rating and everyone else's. So there are protections in the law to make sure that every municipality, every school district, every county, the state of New Hampshire that issues bonds will honor those obligations to their investors because there's just too much at stake if, if there's a default. Um, so that is one of, that's called one of those mandatory assessments. And again, credit rating implications. Um, Obviously, you know, with a default, we would ha certainly have those credit rating um, in impacts. Um, for the bonds, again, Chapter 33 is um, kind of pretty specific as, as to what you can use it for. And again, as I said, it's pretty much for those high cost infrastructure, capital improvement type things. One thing the law does say is that you are prohibited from issuing bonds to cover current maintenance and operation costs unless otherwise authorized by law. So basically what that's saying is you can't put your grocery bill on your credit card. That's what it's saying. You can't put your monthly mortgage on your credit card. You can take out the mortgage and you've got to pay it back, but then you can't 
put that on your credit card is what it's saying. Now, I can tell you um, there have been a couple of exceptions to that where um, there were municipalities that got themselves into, or at least one, that got themselves into a situation where they were in a facing a significant, um, a s significant deficit because of an embezzlement, a very significant deficit because of an embezzlement and mismanagement of town funds by the town manager. And they were in such a deficit that they, they could not raise that money enough in one year to get them out of it. And they had to go to the legislature and ask permission to borrow money, pay it back over a five-year period to get them back on track. Okay, so that's why it says unless otherwise authorized by law. So there could be some exceptions, but generally you can't be you can't be bonding your operating costs. You would not want to do that anyway, right? Um, but in terms of the philosophy behind doing doing bonding, and I know there was one town which I was so surprised. <laughs> You know, it was a few years ago. They said, oh, we never bond. We don't believe in bonding. We just pay for everything right up front. I thought, well, that, you know, that sounds really good not to have any debt. But the whole purpose of bonding, again, because it's, it's these assets that you are expecting to last a really long time. So it's not something that you're going to just use in two or three or four years. These are assets like your water system, your sewer system, your 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 new building, whatever. You expect it to be here 10, 15, or 20 years. So part of what you're doing is that you're, you're structuring the payments for this over the life of the assets so that you're not taxing just today's taxpayers for an asset that is going to benefit the citizens 10 years or 15 or 20 years from now. So certainly if you were to just try to, you know, just put it all in the tax rate right now, that would be huge sticker shock for some of these. But if you're spreading those payments out, it's referred to as intergenerational tax equity. So you're, you're kind of spreading that out. So you're saying, yes, this fire truck is going to benefit us for 10 years. There's no reason today's taxpayers have to pay for the whole thing. And um, usually when you're doing these large capital projects, it's not just one or the other type of financing. Often you'll be putting money in the capital reserve fund to help lower lower the cost of, it, of the, the item or the project. You may be combining it with um, bonding. There may be a grant. And that's where we get into that, that gross basis of accounting, uh, uh, gross basis budgeting in terms of putting the Warren article. So you will often see that it's a large, costly project, but you've got money in a reserve fund. Maybe you have some grant money that's available, and then you've got some bonding. Uh, so it's, it can be multiple financing options for that. Um, there is a limit. Um, again, part of that, those statutes that help protect uh, municipalities, protect the state, there's a debt limit. Uh, it's 3% of your equalized property value that's determined by DRA that's on their website. You're probably nowhere close to it. I wouldn't imagine that you would be close to your debt limit, but it's just good to know that there is a, a limit out there. Many municipalities have their own um, policy in place that sets something more restrictive. They, you can certainly have a policy, excuse me, more restrictive than what the statute requires. Uh, for example, Dover is 65% of whatever the state limit is. So they, they are being more conservative. Um, Concord has an, another policy. I don't know if, um, if Hampton has your own debt, debt policy or not, um, but that is an uh, option that the, uh, usually in, um, it's adopted by the governing body um, in terms of when do, you, when do you expect projects to be financed through bonds? When do you expect projects to be financed maybe solely through those savings accounts? When do you expect it to be part of the operating budget? And some um, municipalities have different thresholds to give department heads ideas, as, you know, kind of direction as to what is expected and have some consistency. Okay? Um, and then certainly, you know, where do you, where do you go to issue these bonds? Um, some municipalities, they issue the bonds directly to Wall Street. You know, usually most of the larger communities do that. Um, most communities will go through the New Hampshire Municipal Bond Bank, which takes all those bond issues that have been approved, for example, in March meeting by schools and towns and village districts. They kind of package it all together, and then they go sell those bonds from the bond bank 
uh, down on Wall Street. So it, it saves you a lot of costs and a lot of um, terms of uh, attorney fees and all those kinds of things by going through the municipal bond bank. So that's probably where you're going for smaller projects. You can certainly go to your local banks. You'll, um, chapter 33 refers to bonds or notes. So if you had a project that you wanted to pay off over three years, maybe it's a you know four million dollar project, and you may just you know your local bank may say, hey, you know we'll finance that for you through a note. So that's another option for water and sewer projects. There is the state revolving loan fund through the Department of Environmental Services, which um, has some very favorable interest rates for municipalities. So often um, that's where most of that financing can go through. Um, in terms of user fees, I wanted to uh, give you a couple of comments on user fees. I'm assuming that you have um, a number of fees in towns. Most municipalities do have a number of fees that they charge for a lot of different things. When you're looking at when you're looking at user fees, the, the kind of the two spectrums are the two ends of the spectrum are whether um, it's a specific service or it's a public service. So. The, the kind of the two ends that I use, for example, are water and sur water and sewer is very specific, and usually in those cases, you know, the people that are receiving the water or you know the water or sewer services, they're paying those water sewer fees. It's covering the full cost of those operations. Whereas a service such as police and fire, that's a public benefit. It's not something that you're going to charge a user fee for. So that's sort of the the two spec you know the, the two ends of the spectrum. But there's a lot of things in, in between, and I think, what was the one you were talking about? Oh, your recreation fees. Recreation, right? recreation fees. fees could certainly fall in, uh, in between. The most important thing is, as I think the very first slide that Steve showed said, they're not a home rule state. So the first thing you have to do when, you, and when there's any fees being considered is you have to say, is there a statute that says we can charge this fee? Because you can't just decide to charge any fee just because the, the town wants to charge a fee. So on this, whatever color you would call this piece of paper, um, we have listed out the different kinds of fees that are authorized by statute that municipalities um, are allowed to, um, to have fees for this. After you've determined that there can be a fee, after the town's determined there can be a fee, then you have to ask what is the appropriate level of cost recovery. Is this something that should be 100% reimbursed so that it's completely covered by the fees? So, for example, with the water and sewer, you want all your direct costs, your indirect costs, your depreciation costs. You want everything included in there so that you're recovering all the costs associated with that. Or is it something that maybe having a town subsidy may make sense. Now, as Steve said, in his town, he's looking for um, the rec department to be fully 100% reimbursable. Some towns may look at the rec department and say, you know, we think it's important that we offer some senior programs and we don't necessarily care if we recover 100% of the cost because we think that's a good service to provide to our elderly citizens. So maybe for those senior programs, recovering 50% of the cost is sufficient, whereas some of the adult programs, like the, you know, the, the, the trip to the Boston Flower Show, yeah, we want to co cover, we don't want to be subsidizing that. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's a, a, you can have a spectrum of, again, even within the, your own department, of where these fees should be and what is the goal. 100% reimbursement, some subsidy, or completely subsidized. And what's important in looking at those fees, though, is understanding what is the cost. You know, you got to understand what the total cost is before you can make the decision of do we want the whole thing covered and reimbursed or do we want to have some subsidy. Um, and then where is this money going to be accounted for? Is it just going to flow through the general fund as just a general fund revenue, a general fund expenditure, or is it going to go through a special revenue fund or a revolving fund if it's allowed as a revolving fund? So in terms of special revenue versus revolving funds, I just wanted to highlight what is the difference between those two. The special revenue fund the, the big difference here is with the special revenue fund is the revenue coming in is isolated, is segregated to that special revenue fund, but it still requires an appropriation to spend from that, okay? So 
the legislative body has decided we're taking this fee, so let's say it's the transfer station, the fees at the transfer station, we're going to put those into a special revenue fund for the purpose of dealing with the expenses of the transfer station. If it's in the special revenue fund, it still has to go back to town meeting every year to appropriate that money out of the special revenue fund. All you've done is you've taken that revenue out of the general fund, so it's no longer part of your general fund revenues, but it still has to have that appropriation by town meeting. The revolving fund, and the revolving funds are limited to certain, um, certain activities by statute. The revolving funds are really for those kinds of things that are hard to predict how much you're going to need. How many ambulance calls are you going to have where you're going to be charging ambulance fees? How much special detail are your police going to be doing? Those things can be hard to predict year to year to year. And that's why some of those um, categories or those um, you know, types of activities are in a revolving fund. Once you set up that revolving fund for special police detail, the idea is the police are going to do the special detail, they're going to get paid, and you're going to charge, let's say it's the vendor that's hiring them, and you're going to charge them a sufficient amount to cover not only the salaries, but the benefits, and, and maybe some overhead costs, and it's going to come in, it's going to cover all those costs, and it's, that fund is just going to keep going. And then you don't have to worry about appropriating every year for that because you don't know how much special detail you're going to need. An example I would use there, there was one town where they got hit very severely with the ice storm. They had public service in for about 18 months doing road work on all the trees that had all the damage from the ice storm and they wanted special police detail for that whole year and a half. Now that town never could have predicted the level of special detail, because remember special detail is being paid by somebody else. They couldn't have predicted that in their budget, how much time public service was going to want for that special detail. So that's just a good example of where a revolving fund like that can be very beneficial from a budgetary standpoint. Um, Another funding opportunity is uh, grants. If you're lucky enough to find somebody that wants to provide grant money to you, I think Steve did mention um, 3195B is, um, is the statute that it's called unanticipated revenue. It allows a municipality, if you've accepted, uh, if you've adopted 3195B, which probably you have, um, it allows you to apply for, accept, and expend without further legislative body action any money that becomes available. So that's, that's a great um, thing to have so that you don't have to wait till the next town meeting to accept, expect that money and, uh, accept that money and appropriate it. You can do it any time that becomes available during the year. Um, however, there is a caveat, and that caveat is it cannot require the expenditure of other unappropriated funds. So that could be a little tricky, for example, if there's, if there's a grant that comes available and they say we'll give you 75% uh, of the cost and you have, to, you have a match of 25%. You haven't appropriated the 25% match, you really can't use 3195B to do that because it requires the expenditures of other funds if you haven't appropriated that other money for that match, okay? Um, <clears throat> there is a public notice requirement, and this was uh, changed fairly recently in 2014. If you, um, if, you if the amount is less than 10,000, you just have to, the, the governing body just has to have a public notice. If it's over 10,000, they have to hold a public hearing on that. Um, the other um, area where some money may be coming from or may not be coming from is the aid from the state of New Hampshire. Um, this is a graph that shows uh, the last 10 years of state aid to municipalities, and these are total dollars, not just Hampton's dollars, okay, but it's total dollars. Um, and this does not include the education funding, so it does not include what school districts get from the state. This is just the municipal portion. And so as you can see in about 2009, is this the thing? so 2009 
it was about um, $150 million that was coming to municipalities. The green is what's called general funding. This was the highway block grant, and this was the um, water uh, grants from the Department of Environmental Services for water sewer projects. The big drop here was when the state was facing the recession in 2008, 2009, they started reducing the funding that was coming to municipalities. The big ones there were revenue sharing. Revenue sharing had been a program that provided $25 million. Um, it has a long history. It goes, it goes way back to when the state put in the business profits tax and started taxing businesses at the state level as opposed to businesses being uh, taxed locally. Um, before that period, and the idea was to share that revenue with municipalities. It had been about $25 million. It got suspended, and it has been suspended ever since. Uh, so that was a big chunk. The other big chunk of money that the state um, started uh, eliminating was the pension contribution for teachers, police, and firefighters. The state was providing 35% of that, um, that pension cost for those three categories. So obviously the police and fire are going to hit you, teachers are going to hit the school districts. Um, and that was gradually eliminated. Um, my estimate right now is that if the state was still paying for those, the teachers, police and fire, that would be about $80 million a year um, is what they would be paying to local governments. So this just gives you sort of a picture, you know, how yeah, they say pictures worth a thousand words. Well, a picture's worth a thousand numbers. So here's the picture of where we are there. Um, one of the things I wanted to explain is um, where are we with the highway funding uh, in the legislature? Because there was quite a bit of um, press about that when the governor first came out with her budget and uh, when the House came out with their budget. If you recall, uh, last year there was quite a bit of activity legislatively about what's called the gas tax. It's really a road toll. It's really a user fee. It's a tax on gasoline. And the more you use, the more you pay. It's, it's a user fee, um, but it does go by the term gas tax. Um, because of the conditions of roads, conditions of bridges in the state, conditions of the I-93 <coughs> expansion between the Massachusetts border and uh, Manchester not having enough money to finish that construction, and the fact that our highway fund just wasn't generating enough money to cover all these needs, there was uh, a recognition that something had to happen. And last year, the gas tax was increased. Now. People involved, legislators involved in this knew that they probably needed to increase it by about 12 to 15 cents a gallon. Had not been increased in 20 years. They knew they had to go up by about 12 or 15 cents, but they passed a four cent increase. Okay. Basically, this is what they said that would do last year. It was going to raise about 33 million each year. And this money, this was going to go to local block grants starting in fiscal year 16, so that's the year that starts July 1st of 15. Four million was going to go to municipalities. They were going to um, do the debt service on I-93. Um, they didn't need it right away because they had to bond it and then they got to start paying it back. So that's why um, it kicked in a couple of years. State bridge aid, <coughs> municipal bridges. If you have a bridge, if back here, back then, if you had a bridge that you needed to apply for state bridge aid, and state bridge aid is the state pays 80% and you, you come up with a 20% match. Um, you had an 8 to 10 year wait. That's how long <coughs> you would have uh, for, to get any funding from the state. That's how long their wait list was. Historically, they had only appropriated $6.8 million, enough to do you know, maybe eight, nine bridges. And there were uh, th over 350 municipal bridges that are considered red listed bridges. Okay, that doesn't include the state red listed bridges. These are just municipally owned red listed bridges. The commissioner at the Department of Transportation, the former commissioner, called it the measles map, the one that has all those red listed municipal bridges. All he called it the measles maps, and he said that was what he lost sleep over at night was those municipal red listed bridges. So obviously, something needed to be done. So part of this four cent increase was going to double the amount of bridge aid with the idea of shrinking that wait list. So it wasn't a 10-year list. It would come down to something like a four or five-year list. 
Um, and then there was uh, these. This is all money going to the state to do their betterment programs on state roads. I kind of call them the connecting roads. Those roads that the state roads that connect all the towns. You know that obviously you know what the conditions of those are like. Um, so that's what that was for. So this was what the statute says. Four cent increase. This is where it's going to go. So that's what everybody expected. This is what was expected, at least from the municipal standpoint. This is what the highway funding had been. There was the block grant, 12% of whatever comes into the highway fund from the gas tax and from motor vehicle fees, 12% goes to municipalities. And then there had been the bridge aid, so it had been 37 million. This four cent increase was gonna give four, four million more to that highway block grant and double the bridge aid, so 6.8. So it was going to be a total of 48.4 million. When the bill passed, which municipalities supported, that's what was expected. When the governor came out with her proposal, she said, "Okay, I can't cut anything. I can't cut any of this money because that's what the law said. That four cents. This is where it's going to go. So I'll just cut the underlying grant." So she cut the bridge aid. Okay. What did the House do in their budget? They said, well, we kinda, we're kind of we kind of interested in what the governor did, so we'll not only accept her cutting the bridge aid, we'll reduce the highway block grant by $4 million. Yeah. So again, they will tell you, they would say, we didn't cut the funding from the, the four cent gas tax increase. You're still getting that funding, but they cut the underlying amount. So what did that actually end up doing? There's what municipalities were getting before the gas tax went in last year. There's what they were going to get with the House budget, basically the same numbers, which was really very discouraging for us because, again, municipalities had supported that because of the need and, and because of the promise that was there. But um, where are we right now? Um, yesterday, the Senate put back the $4 million for each year. So the Senate put back the $4 million. I don't know what they're going to do with the bridge aid. Um, they recognize that that is an issue. Um, there is still the issue that the four cents wasn't really sufficient to fund the state's highway fund and all those needs. Uh, but they will be meeting tomorrow and Thursday, and we are hoping that they will uh, put that $6.8 million back so that it's just, it's just unacceptable that there's a 10-year wait uh, to deal with these bridges. So that's where that one is. Um, meals and rooms tax distribution. Every municipality gets um, a share of the meals and rooms tax that comes into the state. This is one of the state's healthiest taxes in terms of its growth and how well it's doing. And you guys, are, you know, living in a tourist community, you are certainly aware of um, that tourism is a big issue here, and the meals and rooms tax um, is certainly, as I said, one of the the biggest uh, state revenue sources. Under state law, when that tax first went in, in 1967, that law went in and said 60% of the money coming in will go to the state, 40% will go to municipalities. It's going to be a sharing. I can tell you that municipalities have never received anywhere close to 40% of the meals and rooms tax. And because the amount that was going to municipalities was so low, Back in 1993, there was a catch-up formula that was put in because obviously the state couldn't all of a sudden give municipalities 40%. It would be too much of a loss to them. So what they did is they put a catch-up formula in, and they said, okay, if the meals and rooms tax comes in higher one year than it did the previous year, 75% of that increase will go towards municipalities' distribution with a cap of $5 million. So never more than $5 million. So if the money came in $10 million more, it would be 75% would be $7.5 million, but we're going to cap it at five. But if the money came in, let's say, only a million higher, well, then 75% would be 750000 So it was 75% of the increase, but never more than $5 million. And the idea was to gradually increase the, pro the proportion going to municipalities, okay? So that catch-up formula was in for a number of years. It was doing what it was supposed to do until, again, that recession hit, and that was one of the things the state suspended, and they said, we're going to freeze it at $58.8 uh, for a while. So that's what they did. Um, 
it did resume this past year. So municipalities got an extra $5 million in the check they got last December. Okay, they, and I think for Hampton it was about sixty thousand dollars more came in from the meals and rooms distribution because that catch-up formula kicked in again. Okay, um, here's just a graph showing you what's the percentage. Again, here's the forty percent. You could see back in two thousand one it was about seventeen, eighteen percent, and it was doing what it was intended to do. That catch-up formula it was gradually increasing until boom, they suspended it. And not only did they suspend it, but they raised the rate at the same time. So the tax rate went from 8.5% to 9%. The state got a lot more money that year. And because the municipal piece had been frozen, the percentage kind of took a, a, a big dive. So right now, um, it's at about 25%. So um, the governor... Um, Oh, and if it had not been suspended, again, my estimate would have been rather than getting $63 million sharing in $63 million last December, you would have been sharing in $76 million. Um, and over this period of time when they suspended the catch-up formula, that was about $41 million that the state didn't provide to municipalities. Um, so where are we right now with that? Um, the governor suspended it for the first year in her budget. The House suspended it for both years. The Senate today um, put the catch-up formula back in for the second year of the biennium. Um, and again, as I said, what, the real kicker with this is that the Meals and Rooms tax revenue is coming in really strong. It's about $15 million over where it was last year. So municipalities could get that $5 million, and the state would still have another $10 million more than what they had planned. Um, but the state is having some challenges with their budget. So that's where that is. Um, I, I should have prefaced and say I don't really have a lot of good news for you with this, with this part of it. But um, the state aid environmental grants, these are the, the grants for water and wastewater projects under current law. Um, the state is supposed to fund those at a 20% match. In some cases, it can be up to 30%. And they pay it back over the terms of the financing. So if you've taken out a bond and you're paying it back over 20 years, the intent is that the state is going to pay that 20% as you're making those debt payments going forward over 20 years. So they're not going to give you the whole 20% of the project up front. They're going to pay it to you as you're paying off your debt. Okay? Um, for a period from 2009 to 2013, they stopped approving any new grants. Um, and these projects were placed on what was called a delayed and deferred list, basically saying, you know, keep doing what you're doing and someday we'll hopefully the state will give you the money. Um, there was a moratorium was placed on any new projects that are placed on any projects that received local approval after December of 2008. So basically what they were saying was if if, you, if municipalities went to their town meeting before December 2008 to, to approve these projects and the voters understood there's going to be a 20% share of the state, we'll honor that. But if, you know, December 2008, they started getting word out that, you know, the state doesn't have a lot of money here, so you, if you proceeded with any projects after that time, you did so at your own peril. So that's sort of the, where that December 2008 comes in. Um, in terms of the governor and the House and the Senate budget, they have uh, funded all those existing obligations. So anything that had already been receiving uh, payments and you're still on that sort of the tail to pay it off, those are funded. But they are not looking at granting any, any new projects since that um, December 2008. Um, and again, this is just a picture's worth a thousand words, so it shows you know, what had been the level of funding, you know, about 17 million, 16, 17 million, and then when this moratorium went in, what they have to pay was dropping down because, again, as they're paid it off, as the debt payments are made, eventually some of the projects, they get paid off. So there's less and less and less they have to pay. This little bump up was when they said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll pay for that de delayed and deferred list, this last budget go around. Um, they, they did pay for the pro some of the projects on that list, but now 
we're back into this phase where they're saying we're not doing anything now. They did, um, both the House and Senate did pass a bill to set up a study committee to look at this program and determine how, if and how this should go forward. Should there be, you know, a change in the criteria for some of these projects? Um, where, what should the funding source be? So it will be studied and we'll see where that takes us. And finally, I did want to show you um, this. This is the um, what's happened to the local employer rates for pensions because of the fact that the state stopped making those contributions. So y you can see um, that was in about 2009. I think they started ratcheting it down. I mean, there, there clearly there are other reasons why the pension costs increase, but um, from your standpoint, one of the big reasons was the um, contribution towards police and fire. It, hopefully we have the red line is the fire and the blue line is the police. Sometimes I get those backwards, <laughs> maybe wrong, the, the wrong colors for those. But um, yeah, so you know, pretty big increases here. And a lot of that is because the state stopped those contributions. So in terms of you know, what can you expect um, from state aid right now, where that stands with the Senate is um, is the highway block grant money is coming, that is supposed to be coming. Uh, we don't know where things are with that bridge aid, and they funded the um, additional money from the meals and rooms in the second year of the biennium. So that's what's kind of coming coming back in terms of those environmental grants. Neither the House or Senate is looking at funding those. Um, and I think those are sort of the, the big issues. Revenue sharing, that $25 million in revenue sharing, it's still being suspended and nobody's talking about that coming back. Um, again, in terms, back to, uh, so how do, you, how do you fund your budget? I think Steve mentioned too, you can use um, your general fund balance. As he said, the authority to spend lapses at year end. And what happens when that money lapses? So you have an appropriation of, you know, ten thousand dollars, but you only spend eight thousand. What happens to that other two thousand dollars that you had the authority to spend? You raised the money, either through the tax rate or whatever, and then you didn't spend it. It becomes part of what's called the fund balance. So that your fund balance grows by not spending all your appropriations that you're authorized, or by bringing in more money than you planned. So if you thought you're going to bring in a million dollars in motor vehicle fees and you brought in one million one hundred thousand dollars because a lot of people started buying newer cars that excess hundred thousand because your tax rate was set based on that one million dollars so that extra hundred thousand kind of becomes part of your fund balance you don't get to spend that extra hundred thousand because remember you're locked into that bottom line appropriation so that's where um, your, ex your fund balance grows. And you do have to take into account taxes that haven't been collected or other bills that you haven't paid. But that's generally what it is. Um, what do you do with the fund balance? You, re you, re can you retain it for cash flow purposes. I'm sure your town treasurer would say, no, you, you, you got to be careful because there are times when they, the treasurer has to make payments to the school district. You've got to make payments to the county. You know, you've got to have money for cash flow. Most towns try to avoid having to issue tax anticipation notes, and that's where your cash comes in, you know, having that in hand to cover that. Um, it can be a source of... Revenues for future appropriations often see to raise and appropriate ten thousand dollars for XYZ project to come from fund balance. A lot of times that will be sold as uh, it's not going to cost anything because we're going to take it from fund balance. Well, it's the way to kind of that spin has, it. I have to say that's the one that drives me crazy. I'm sure you can see that's a lot of things that drive me crazy. When the select board says, "Oh, this has no tax effect," I said, "That's just malarkey. That was money raised two years ago. It has a tax effect. Don't ever say that. That's awful." And part of it is, it can be used to reduce the taxes. The the governing body can determine how much of the fund balance they want to use. What how much at the time the tax rate's being set. How much do we want to use of our fund balance to hold down the tax rate? Well, if you've taken this 10000 and that 20000 and you put it all on specific articles, that just makes that pot smaller. You're not just not going to have it. So I don't know. A good, good selling point It's for some. <laughs> you know. um, as Steve mentioned, 
um, retaining it. And the recommendation, it, ooh, re recommendation is to uh, have a certain amount that you're retaining. We recommend that the, you have a, that the governing body have a policy in place so that this isn't something that they're deciding every single year. That they have a policy with sort of a goal as to what do we want our um, you know our level of fund balance to be, what's appropriate for us. Um, and with that said, I wanted to get into just a little bit of a discussion about the property taxes. And this is this is actually spread out on a building in Washington D.C. This whole thing, taxes are what we pay for a civilized society. It's on the IRS building. <laughs> so, um, a few words about property taxes. Um, it's the tax people love to hate, and unfortunately, it's the primary funding sources of lo source of local government funding in New Hampshire. It's what uh, we all have to live with, as you know probably better than uh, most people uh, in your town. Um, there are some benefits from a some from a philosophy standpoint. There are some benefits to property taxes. It is a relatively stable source of revenue compared to other what's called other broad-based taxes like sales taxes or income taxes. It is uh, relatively stable. It hits those non-residents um, as opposed to um, an income tax, which would only hit your residents. Um, it's locally levied and administered, and there's certainly um, you know some some perceptions that taxes that are more locally assessed and collected or closer to the citizens um, are more reflective of the services they want than the state assessing a tax and deciding what goes back. Um, there can be an argument that property taxes finance property related services, your water, your sewer, your plowing, the you know quality of life with your library and those kinds of things. Property taxes are very difficult to evade, as opposed to something like um, sales taxes. You know, so that you you know where your town boundaries are. You know the property in your town. So they're very. It's very difficult to evade property taxes, and it promotes local autonomy. It reflects your local priorities. We often say that your budget is basically it's your it's your um, fiscal philosophy for the town, and that budget is is what's. You know, going to equate to the property taxes, so the two of them are integral to each other. It's it's your priorities, and then paying for them. Although sometimes some of your citizens may forget that what they voted for in March is now what they have to pay the bill for in December. Um, for the property tax process, there's basically generally four steps. It's the appraisal process, a revaluation process that is usually occurs um, at least every five years. Then there's the assessment process. The difference between the appraisal and the assessment is the assessment is pulling in some of those statutory exemptions and the statutory credits, like your elderly exemptions or those religious charitable entities um, that are exempt, and things like your veterans credits. Um, the rate is um, computed per thousand dollars of assessment, and then there's the collection process where it's levied. There's that um, warrant that goes from the selectmen as the assessors to the tax collector, giving the tax collector the authority to bill this. There, there's a leaning process on those delinquent taxes and ultimately a deeding process if those taxes aren't collected. So that's sort of the four phases of the property tax. In terms of calculating the tax rate, it's your gross appropriation. So whatever the bottom line is that the, the voters approved back in March, less Revenues other than property taxes. This is and this is general, but so you can take out those other revenues like your motor vehicle fees or um, land use change tax fees or you know the, the federal the state money coming in those things. Go to add back what's called overlay. Those overlays to cover abatements, um, and then these war service credits. That's the veterans credits because even though those veterans are getting a reduction, you still have to raise the full amount of your budget. So if you're giving you a reduction, everybody else has to pay for that, okay? Um, and that's the net municipal tax effect. Um, you divide that by the assessed value, and it's expressed per $1,000 of valuation. So that's kind of a simple uh, explanation of the formula.